Hi, everyone, and welcome to this Talking Insomnia episode where I'm super excited, I'm extra excited to have Alex Seguze with us. Welcome. Uh, thanks for having me. And by the way, did, this, did I say that correctly? Uh, not quite. I think it's kind of, kind of possible to say my name the way, like, the correct way if you're not a native Russian speaker. So I usually don't bother correcting. <laughs> okay. So it, it's fine whichever whichever way you feel like it sounds most natural for you. Okay, I'll, I'll stick with my Alexei then. Um, so yeah, for, for for those of you who don't don't know Alexei, I, I just want to share uh, a little bit about how I, we got in touch, which was uh, this was I think it was about two years ago or so now. But I randomly, or how long was it? Uh, a year and a half. Yeah, I published one. my piece in November 2019. Yeah, so around that time, I, I randomly got a tweet from someone who just uh, tagged me and said, hey, you should look at this. And this was not nobody I knew that they probably just knew I would be interested. And I saw this essay that was on a book that it has a lot of problems, which we'll talk a lot about today. But I just want to say that when I saw that that tweet, I was like, wow, finally, this is happening because I've interacted with so many people who have read this book that we'll talk more about today, Why We Sleep by Matt Walker, and it's filled them with so much anxiety and so much trouble sleeping. And I tried to, to review this book myself, and I, I could not get past the first, the, literally the first page, because it was like, oh my gosh, this is terrible. I left it there. But for such a long time, I felt that there was like the emperor's new clothes thing, that like this book is out there causing so much damage, and nobody's talking about it. So it was such a relief. When I got the tweet about your essay, and and you're a true hero to me and all everybody in the Somnia community, you've done so much amazing work here. So I just want to first of all say thank you so much for that, and thank you for being here. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, I'm very I'm very glad that you enjoyed the essay and that you uh, it, it turned out to be so important. I, I, I never expected it to make uh, to, to make so much impact. I guess. Oh, it has much made a huge difference and it will make more and more difference but but before so take a step back and just um uh for everyone in the community who doesn't know you uh just a few words on uh, who are you right yeah so i'm a researcher i'm originally from moscow russia and uh i primarily think so my background is in economics uh, i also studied biology and neuroscience and these days i primarily think about the structures of science and about the structures of academia and about the ways we can make academia and basic science better. And uh, yeah, so so I publish research uh, on this topic. I am uh, start, starting my own organization now to serve as a vehicle for m my further thinking and for the things I want to do with my quest of improving the way academia is structured and the way science is done. And this, uh, uh, so, so, the uh, the why we sleep piece is not part of my I guess uh, is not related in any way really to the thing that to either my professional background or to the thing that I spend most of my time thinking. The the way it came about was basically because I was talking to a friend of mine who is really really smart and he, about sleep and he recommended this book to me and. I watched Walker's TED talk and it seemed kind of fishy. And I started reading his book and I thought, well, maybe the book is better uh, because, well, he, he's such a famous professor after all. And he's like, what well, one of the world's most famous experts on sleep. And it turned out that the, the book is just really, really bad. And I felt sort of the need to, uh, well, first of all, show show my friend that he's wrong, but also to, to, to correct the, uh, uh, the written record, I guess, uh, because it, it does seem that like question of uh, the, the questions relating to sleep are very, very important. And it seemed like this book was just really, really, really wrong. 100%. And so you kind of answered what was going to be my next question, which was how did it come about? So it's a conversation with your friend and you felt almost a need to, it's almost like a not almost like a moral, but like a, almost like a moral thing. Like you, this has to be set straight or something like that, right? Yeah, basically. Yeah, I, I think you have a sort of an, like outside, uh, outside desire to like correct people on the internet, essentially. Uh, we, and this, this was a part of it. 100%, I'm oh, so glad that happened. And so 
Uh, and we talked a little bit about this, but uh, so when you got the book and you started reading it, what was it kind of like your first reaction, first impression? Uh, well, actually, like my very first impression was very bad because as I started to read it in like the very first or in the second paragraph, I don't remember now, but in the first two paragraphs of the book, like there were immediately claims that seemed extremely implausible and that immediately uh, made me quite skeptical. And then as I kept reading, as I kept, kept reading, it just became worse and worse. So for example, like, so, so the very first thing that popped out was his claim about cancer and Walker states like in, in the first, first or second paragraph that consistently sleeping less than six or seven hours a night doubles your risk of cancer. And this immediately seemed really implausible because I couldn't figure out like how one would arrive at such knowledge because it would seem that you probably need to do some sort of a randomized controlled trial to, to, to make such confident statements about like dependence between uh, like a certain lifestyle choices and incidents of disease. And I figured, well, it's quite unlikely that anyone actually did a study uh, that would enable one to be so confident. And it turned out that yes, no, nobody did uh, such RCTs. The data that we do have is correlational, which means that we can like make suggestive inferences based on it, on the relationship between various lifestyles lifestyle factors and diseases but then like even the correlational data that we have does not support this assertion at all like there's several dozen different types of cancers and i think like if we look at a, a couple of them there is some like relationship between sleep and cancer but if we look at the at overall cancer incidence of cancer and sleep then there's just no relationship between the amount of sleep people we get, the amount of sleep people get and cancer rates. So like even the correlational data, which is by itself um, very, very unreliable, does, does not support the assertion at all. Uh, yeah, and, and from then on, it, it, it just kept, like, uh, kept becoming worse and worse. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, it's Exactly. And that's why I stopped at the first page for exactly the reason you mentioned. And, and now I'm getting curious about like, you know, was it sort of like where during the read, was it when you were reading the book at some point that you decided I got to write an essay or was it after the book or when did that uh, mind uh, thought come in? Yeah, I, I think this was, I mean, th this happened. I don't remember when exactly, but I think it happened within the first chapter when I, I also like started noticing like a lot of other things and yeah, it just became obvious that the, the book is deeply, deeply flawed. And it, it seemed that uh, quite likely that this is going to continue and it did continue. And then like I spent a, a while just like collecting all of the wild claims throughout the book that has no relationship to reality and like try to figure out how to structure the essay and what to include, what not to include. And then after some time I figured out, I, I realized that way there's like so much stuff just in the, so much wrong just in the first chapter that I need to actually set aside the rest of the book and just concentrate on the first chapter. And then, uh, yeah, which I think served me well because it made like the task manageable and I figured, okay, I'm just going to find the five worst uh, claims in, in the first chapter and focus on them and like maybe like write an appendices about some other stuff, but be as focused as I can on, on this just five statements. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. And that, that was another thought I had in the past was like, uh, you know, which you answered now was like, wh why did you focus on the first chapter? It was really like, it would be such an immense work of debunking everything that's in the book that you said, I'm going to stick to the first chapter, which again, it's total sense. Yeah. yeah. And then, um, and then I want to, of course, as we talked about before, talk about uh, more about the storytelling and the reaction and everything else, but let's stop here for a second then and go through, um, if you could pick again, let's say the three, uh, the three biggest flaws or problems that you found 
uh, which ones would you pick? Right. So I think the uh, the one that I already mentioned with with cancer is, uh, I think one of the, one of the biggest ones because it is just like it feels so, so incredibly important if it is true and it feels like it should have such a big like if this was the case like this would like change change how i sleep for sure i would be like these days i'm like sometimes i sleep more sometimes i sleep less and like it try not to like run up any sleep depth but uh, I, I do not like i'm not very careful about always getting like the, the 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 amount of sleep I like my organism naturally needs and like if this true if this claim was true then I would just be very very careful about about that uh, uh, but so, so that other two claims I think the other one that I also note in the beginning about in the beginning of my essay is about the relationship between sleep and general mortality. And there it's the pretty similar thing. Walker says that the longer you sleep, the longer you live. And then if you look at the association between sleep and mortality, it's a U-shaped curve. And the uh, and also it's uh, like the it's U-shaped, but it's actually pretty flat. So that like if you look at mortality, then between like four and eight hours of sleep, the mortality is very, very similar. But then, which like uh, does not mean that people should just sleep four hours, but it also like, it, like at least should raise questions on like, wait, wait, is this like the case because there's some very small number of people who naturally can sleep four hours a night and it's okay for them. And this is how they show up in statistics. Or is it the case that it might like, we might be over appreciating how much it is important to sleep just eight hours instead of maybe less depending on circumstances and also again but but again the, this data is not informative because then there is another issue of like sometimes people sleep a lot because they have a disease or sometimes people sleep little because they have a disease right so like if you have i think if you have a like if you had a heart a heart stroke then uh, you would have problems with sleep frequently. And on the other hand, people who are like depressed have uh, very long sleep. And also they, are, of, of course, have increased uh, uh, increased suicide risk, which would probably affect, uh, affect their life expectancy. So, so, so the thing is like our data is just really, really bad. And we have no idea how much we should really sleep. We probably like should sleep the amount of time that makes us feel good in some very general sense. But this is uh, so, sort of the, this recommendation is very difficult to formalize in any, any neat formulas that could then be solved. This, solve this like simple rules for life. Uh, yes. Yeah, so, so this is the second thing. The third thing is uh, the whole claim about epidemic of lack of sleep. So Walker, Walker is pretty big on this thing. And he notes that over the last several decades, uh, we have experienced dramatic reduction in the amount of sleep people have. And like he has this really, really dramatic graph in the book where people slept like on average more than eight hours, like 96, approximately in 1960s. And less than six hours in 2010. And first of all, the data, I couldn't find any substantiation of the data anywhere. And it seems extremely implausible that people slept more than eight hours on average at any point in the past. Uh, and also the data that I found from developed countries shows that uh, the, the, the number of people who sleep more than the recommended amount of, or like who, who sleep a lot is actually increasing over time or is either stable or sometimes increasing. So in the UK, for example, people started sleeping more by I think 30 or 40 minutes on average over the last few decades. And the average amount of reported sleep is close to seven hours, which uh, sort of turns the, the entire sleep death epidemic on its head, I think. And it's, 
Yeah, and, and again, like of course, it's clear that like there's a lot of people who undersleep, but it's also appears to be the case that even more people sleep just ju ju just enough, and uh, it, it's kind of questionable wh whether we should try to create this narrative of an ever worsening problem with the lack of sleep in our society. Uh, yeah, so this is also kind of connected to this. I mentioned that they couldn't find the substantiation of Walker's data related to the decrease in the average amount of sleep people get. And there is like similar problems with a bunch of his statements where like he makes statements and it's just like impossible to substantiate them, where sometimes he has this pretty weird claims about numbers uh, like for example the number of medical errors decreasing 400 percent which is uh, like actually impossible because if some, something decreases 100 percent it turns to zero so like a decrease of 400 percent means the doctors made negative number of errors and then he like repeats a similar mistake several times throughout the book with like brain activity in infants and something else which is pretty weird and uh, of course, like cannot even in principle co correspond to any real data. And the, the other thing, like in one case, he actually just like literally cuts off a bar of a graph where like the, he's trying to make an argument and like the paper that he actually cites to try to substantiate his argument, like is kind of equivocal. It doesn't show like the, the straight trend that he would like to see so like the graph the actual graph is kind of looks kind of like this and he just cuts out one part part of the graph and re re reprinted the uh, essentially fake graph in, in, in the book uh, which also seems like should not be acceptable for an academic uh, so yeah the, 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 this i think are the, the the main problems i would guess that one thing that would be interesting for you as as a doctor, or I would actually be, if you allow me, I would be interested in hearing your take on the, the entire sleep deprivation therapy thing, because I'm like not a specialist and a like read a bunch of papers and they say that it's very safe unless you have bipolar disorder. And it's like, it's of course it's super difficult to maintain, like try to use it consistently over, over time. And it's like more of a one-off thing, but uh, at the same time, it is very effective at, so that like, even if you like cut, like under sleep a lot or skip sleep for one night, your depressive symptoms uh, become sim uh, quite a lot better. And uh, I'm curious, like, <laughs> do you actually use this in practice? Or is this like, actually, th does this actually work as well as the, the, the papers say it works? or like is it practical yeah yeah you know i'm i'm very familiar with the literature and the a lot of the studies out there are quite like impressive uh, all there's they're small they're quite impressive when you kind of like have somebody not sleep at all for 24 hours and then you ask them like how depressed you feel even after some time they report feeling much better but i think yeah yes it's, it's not used clinically i believe anywhere in the world nobody ever does like sleep deprivation as treatment and I think um, the problem I see with it is more like, I know, I know you're uh, not too familiar with like the world of insomnia, but in the world of insomnia where I live, uh, so much of it is like, if you imagine somebody who has trouble sleeping and they don't really understand why, and, but it's kind of like a fear inside them and you give them any kind of, any type of strange pill, like Tibetan salt from a goat or something like that, then that person may take it and feel much better and sleep better for a while just because they kind of believed it or something happened or some change. And I think it's a little bit the same with the sleep deprivation that you just sleep deprive one for someone for 24 hours. And it's just a jolt to the system. It's kind of something new and they just feel like better for a while, but a week later, two weeks later, I think it probably doesn't really help long-term is my thoughts on that. Right. But uh, yeah, thanks you for sharing all this. And I think we can, we'll just conclude that, you know, there are so many flaws with this book that, you know, we you, you can't even count them. And, and some of them are like very hard to, to substantiate. And other things like he makes claims, like you said about like the correlation between sleep duration and mortality, which we actually have big studies on that, that just does not in any way substantiate what he says. So a lot of problems there, but 
Um, for, and for anyone who wants to really get into it, I will, of course, post the link to your essay in the description here. But OK, so you, so you did the essay and um, you completed that. And I, I, by the way, I have to sneak this one in here. There was like a tweet from you like the day before you released your essay when you said, like, the essay is done and the book is dead. And I was like, wow, that was that's so strong. I love that one. But anyway, uh, so you released the essay and uh, what happened next? What was kind of reactions and, um, and what was it like then? Right. Yeah, well, the, the reaction was overwhelm overwhelmingly positive. Uh, I got a lot of retweets on Twitter. Uh, the essay got on uh, uh, like a bunch of sites and it got a lot of readers. Uh, and yeah, I think this is uh, the this mostly described. It. I was pretty surprised by the amount of attention we got, and especially by like the emails that I got from a lot of people who did like get insomnia after reading the book and get sleep anxiety after reading the book, but also from like sleep researchers who were like uh, actually. So so you are sort of a. Uh, so like you're you're not a sleep researcher, you like treat people with insomnia, right? But I get like emails both from practitioners, but also from researchers who like publish academic papers on sleep and neuroscience. And they were like, yeah, we're like, uh, knew that the, the book is terrible and the, the research that the site is, or like the way research presented uh, in the book is just really, really bad. And we like either couldn't figure out how, how, how it's like, uh, give this information to the public or like the one one of the emails mentioned that Walker brought so much attention to the field and so much money into the field that like no nobody just wanted to speak out uh, against him essentially uh, so that was kind of depressing and uh, some there, there was a bunch of criticism but I think criticism of me well, at least the way I see it, it mostly boiled down to like me liking sleep and credentials or worker having more experience in sleep. And uh, I, I believe in like not, essentially not, not a single major claim that they made was uh, significantly disputed. Amazing. And I remember that, yeah, you're, I think your, your Twitter following just exploded and so many retweets and it was amazing. It made me so happy. And and I think two things that you brought up now that are so important. One is kind of like it, it, what I thought when, when, when this happened was that it, it, it was almost kind of impossible for somebody within the field to have done what you did. Because as you said, the book was, I mean, the, the Why We Sleep was such a, it was a bestseller. And, and not only that, like he went on podcasts and, and, and shows and the message kind of spread all over the world without any foundation for it but what it created was basically the scenario where everyone like so many people kind of benefited from it like researchers it was easier for them to get funding uh, thanks to all the fear it was easier for people to sell courses and blogs and like and that's really the sad story here that you know fear kind of leads to selling stuff and money and but anyway sorry going back to that where i started was that well it it it, it created more business for you too by getting a lot of people yeah. sleep anxiety and sleep problems. <laughs> yeah, no, I, exactly. This is a weird scenario. But in a way, like Sleepwalker is creating so much business for me because some people, but of course I don't want that. So, but, but yeah, totally. And, but I think it was so important. It, it had to be kind of an outsider to do this because so many researchers, they, they, they were so scared. They couldn't save themselves. So absolutely. But and I want to go with... Um, uh, what happened? So there was a lot of attention, a lot of uh, talk about it. And then I think, were you on BBC or something with Matt Walker or did that happen? Or did you ever get to like uh, spar with him or debate with him or anything like that? Uh, I never debated with him. Uh, what happened? Yeah, so I was invited on BBC to uh, talk about my essay. And Walker was also invited, but we were invited separately and we gave comments separately. And then we're, they were edited together, but I, I don't believe the program made it, tr tried to make it seem like we were having a debate. They just like gave a bunch of comments from me. They like gave a bunch of comments from him and then like concluded with, uh, uh, I, I don't quite remember what they concluded, but they gave some like 
some sort of a balanced take uh, on the issue. I see. I see. But yeah, and, and also Walker did reply to my essay uh, in a, a, what I thought was a pretty weird way on a blog on WordPress that was like uh, used his internet handle, but that never got connected to like any of his other uh, like online identities. So it wasn't clear f- to me for a few months whether he wrote the post or not. And then like UC Berkeley officially confirmed that he wrote the post and then actually now he links that post on his site. Uh, but it, it seemed to me that the, the reply was also pretty bad and mostly like replied to things that superficially sound like points that I could make, but not actually the points that I make. You, you brought up something which I remember so vividly, which was that, you know, your essay came out, your tweet came out, it went viral, and there were so many people that obviously tagged Matt Walker on Twitter, where he is active, and then there was, like, nothing. There was not even a comment from Walker, like, not a comment, nothing. It was kind of dead silence, and I was personally kind of just waiting and waiting and waiting for the reply, because I wanted to jump on the reply, of course, but, 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 there was nothing. And then, as you said, this kind of weird little thing. So it basically, to me, what it signals is somebody who kind of like, I don't want to talk about it. I don't want more attention here or something like that. But yeah, that was odd. But uh, now kind of to, to a couple more things here. This is something that came to me when I, when this, this all was going on was like the question of responsibility. You know, when, when if a random person would write why we sleep, then it probably wouldn't get much attention. It would just be kind of like, oh, this is some kind of sensational book that you know, nobody ever reads. But when a professor at a well-known, uh, respected uh, university publishes some of that, that's, that's when it gets attention. That's when people believe it and it you know, reverberates throughout the universe like that. So in your sort of opinion, who's, who, who has responsibility for, for work like this? Is it just the author? Is it the publisher? Is it, is it, should there be some fact-checking? Is it the university? Like who is, or is it just free speech? What what are your thoughts on that? Um, I don't think I have a very coherent answer here. I do think that like free speech is generally important and like science is always advancing and like sometimes the things that we think are wrong today turned out to be true and like it, it would be pretty bad if publishers just decided to like or like not publish anything that contradicts the modern scientific consensus or something because like we 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 sort of see what, what like what happened with the like a lot of coronavirus, for example, recommendations where experts just kept flip-flopping between recommendations. And like, if we were trying to follow these like scientific consensus policies, like we would have to send their, the opposite views every month, essentially, uh, which seems kind of stupid. Uh, at the same time, so, so I don't think that publishers really have responsibility uh, because they, yeah, it's just a very difficult issue. Uh, in terms of u- the university, I, I don't think that the university carries some uh, amount of uh, responsibility here because some of the things Walker did in the book do, in fact, it seems to me amount to uh, essentially scientific misconduct where he cuts out bars on the graph or presents data that appears to just not exist. Uh, and uh, you know, UC Berkeley, uh, one, of, one of the readers of my essay inquired to UC Berkeley about the book and they, uh, and they apparently looked into this and didn't find any wrongdoing at all. And they were like, there, there were a couple of minor errors in the book and uh, Dr. Walker mentioned that uh, it said that he's going to fix them, so everything is okay. And uh, this seems kind. This seemed kind of bizarre because there were like, just a couple of minor errors. Uh, and like the, it seems that like basically the, the, the core message of the book is first funda- fundamentally wrong, and second, 
like the, there were things that seemed just like intentionally misleading. Uh, then Walker, of course, he bears the responsibility for presenting uh, misleading arguments and misleading data. Although I'm not sure whether, like how much to attribute bad intent to him, because it does seem that he just like genuinely believes that sleep is really, really important. And this, like I can very well see how he like always believed that sleep is really, really important. And he has been studying the question for 20 years and sort of got like, well, he, so he's like Hansel is sleep diplomat, right? So he seems he, he sees himself as a, essentially an advocate of sleep. And given such uh, an image, it is very easy to get carried out and like maybe, well, I don't know about actually, well, making up data, the, this, this is much more difficult to excuse, but a lot of the things around like him just like really believing in the importance of like getting exactly eight hours of sleep uh, probably stems from him just like being genuinely concerned about people as well. Uh, and uh, yeah, so, so I do think that he bears the responsibility, but at the same time, uh, I, I would be uh, careful not to just try to paint him as someone who is just like trying to, uh, trying to lie to everyone and like make a lot of money. It appears that he does really care about the issue. He's probably, yeah, I think that he's probably just like get carried away and that he's probably just like, and then he's probably just wrong about a bunch of things. 100%. So, so well said. Uh, so well said, Alexei. And, uh, and this I, echoes my sentiment too. Like it's, e it's easy to be kind of judgmental and being like, you're just doing this for your self-interest. But you never know where people come from. There's, I'm sure he also, like all of us, like we all deep down want to make the world a better place and do something that fills us with purpose. So, so try not to judge. But yeah, it has a lot of problems. And, and I want to say again that um, I, I get a lot of um, questions about the book and and it's been so great to just say hey check out this essay by Alex Aguse and uh and and somebody just last week was like thank you so much he was just like even just knowing that there's a debate about this just makes me feel so better because in the world I am there's so much anxiety about sleep and you can see how your work really helps there so I just want to say thanks again and, and as final question to you um uh, what's next for for you what's uh, what's on the horizon what are you working on Right, yeah, so I mentioned in the beginning that I'm studying the structures of science. And uh, the thing that I'm working on right now is I'm starting a nonprofit and I applied for a 501c3 status already. And the, the goal of the nonprofit will be in the long term to actually try to build the new institutions of basic science over like very long term. And in the short term, I hope to support a bunch of young scientists and enable them to carry out basic research that they couldn't uh, figure out uh, otherwise and to try to make uh, an impact in this uh, small scale way. Uh, yeah, and, and try to like, uh, yeah, essentially enable a bunch of young biologists to pursue interesting uh, research questions uh, that hopefully would make uh, an impact in the long term. And that would hopefully eventually uh, turn into something bigger and into something more important. Love it. And uh, for um, for people who hear this and want to know more about you and, and support you and follow you, et cetera, where where's the best places to uh, to connect with you? Uh, yeah. So so my uh, the best place is my personal site, guzi.com, and uh, the site of my nonprofit is newscience.org. I'll, I'll, I'll link to those in the uh, description here. So perfect. I will say again, thanks so much for coming on. Um, um, anything I can help with that ever, you know, please let me know and, uh, and good luck with all your future endeavors. Yeah, uh, th 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 thanks so much for inviting me on the show. Yeah, it was great to talk. Thank you.